Well, my name is Eric Vermetten. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and uh, I work uh, through the Ministry of Defense and I'm a professor of psychiatry in Leiden University Medical Center and I'm also a professor at ARC, our National Psychotrauma Center. It's located in Diemen. And I work mainly with um, people who've been affected by trauma, either uniformed or non-uniformed. In the military, it could be veterans or active duty servicemen. Uh, and my research focus is also on helping uh, to better uh, understand and treat people who've been affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm in Finland for the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research. And they are organizing an event uh, for um, educating the community here in Helsinki to educate people on the current developments and the science that's around psychedelics at this moment. I'm trained as a psychiatrist in the Netherlands and uh, I spent some time overseas in the United States at Yale University, I was at Emory and I was at Stanford and I was working there with, um, with groups who were actually doing neuroscience research in, um, in populations of veterans care, Vietnam veterans and others and that caught my attention and uh, at that time I was very devoted to do neuroscience research in that group of people. I went back to the Netherlands and I sort of continued a neuro research line in PTSD in the Netherlands and then I was recruited by the Ministry of Defense to explore that even further and to uh, I became a head of research at the Military Mental Health Care Research Center in the Netherlands and that's what I'm currently doing and I'm sort of um, uh, developed further into research as a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University where my focus is on one end to get a better frame of understanding so post-traumatic stress re reactions, uh, the neuroscience that's driving that but also uh, find ways to um, uh, sort of let's say innovate, innovate a therapeutic outcome and that could be by a series of outcomes or series of innovations uh, in virtual reality but it could also be in novel compounds and novel novel explorations in novel compounds like like psychedelics that could have potentially uh, a, 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 a novel way of delivering therapy. The studies that you see reported in literature are about people who are affected by PTSD and um, there is an interest in uniformed professionals and uh, there's a couple of studies by a group in the US that actually have been looking at the contribution of MDMA assisted psychotherapy for uniformed professionals including veterans and um, that has my attention and that caught my eye so there is a population that's affected with PTSD and uh, you can see them in the uniformed professional range and you can also see them in the, uh, in the military, uh, specifically in veterans, where that do not respond to evidence-based uh, treatments um, that the way you wanted them to respond. So you need to find ways that their um, responses could enhance the outcome better. And um, I'm intrigued by the research that recently has been reported in literature where uh, MDMA was used as an adjunct to psychotherapy to see if uh, the response could be optimized. And I was uh, pretty amazed with the data that was reported. So I felt that there was a need to dive into it to see if we could learn to implement that in our ways of healthcare delivery uh, to give a better care for these specific groups of people. I heard about MDMA for the first time uh, probably in, uh, actually it was at a, a context of the American Psychiatric Association conference. I think it was in San Francisco or another city in the US where I heard a talk by, um, by Rick Doblin that I didn't know, it was about four years ago. And I heard him talk about LSD and psychedelics in the treatment of PTSD in a symposium that he'd organized. And I didn't know much about MDMA or psychedelics before. I mean, not to the extent that I got to know later, I heard a little bit about the work of LSD that a countryman of mine, Jan Bastians, had done in the, in the, after the Second World War, where he was treating, treating um, concentration camp survivors. 
But that was a little bit sort of dormant in my memory. And when I was at this conference, I heard this, uh, this guy, Rick Dublin, talk about this therapy and extending it to MDMA. And that was intriguing for me because I, I wasn't aware of, of any therapeutic effects of MDMA. And, you know, I'm not very, I wasn't even that much aware of ecstasy and the recreational arm of all that because it was not in sort of my domain of, 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 of interest that much. But from that moment in time, I, I, I couldn't sort of let it go because of the, the strong potential that it had. And I had the urge to explore it better and deeper. Since I learned about the, um, the studies where MDMA has been used as catalyst for the psychotherapeutic process, I uh, felt an urge to bring that to the Netherlands and to start working on a, a protocol where we could um, learn to use it in a psychotherapeutic setting. And um, I wanted not to do that only on my own, but form a team. So now we have a team of, of eight therapists in the Netherlands that is partnering with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Drug Studies, uh, to learn to use MDMA in this particular context and to also to, um, to help with um, getting the data extended to such an event that we probably could convince the FDA in the US and the EMA in Europe that it could deserve an indication for, uh, for the treatment of PTSD. So we're doing studies now that actually contribute to the data set that actually MAPS is trying to acquire to help uh, uh, support the evidence for the indication of uh, an, a novel indication for the treatment of PTSD. And the data, the preliminary data in the phase two trials have been so strong that it's it's, well, the evidence is not there yet, but the evidence is so strong that it's very likely that this could lead to a novel indication for the treatment of PTSD. And I care about that because what I, what I feel is that we, we need better treatments for, for PTSD. And this one is so strong and it's so disruptive to how we look at psychotherapy and the way that psychotherapy is conducted in this novel way is so, I would say, pleasant, so um, yeah, healing in a novel way that um, I'd like to get more, um, um, more expertise in that and to spread that to a wider community of therapists. MDMA is an interesting uh, psychedelic compound. It's sort of a soft compound in the psychedelic range. It's, it's, it has different names. And what I feel so intriguing about MDMA is that it allows um, the person to explore with a sort of an inner journey to be confronted or to be invited to um, parts of his or her life that uh, resemble hotspots. And when I say hotspots, these may be put in or maybe it may capture uh, um, events that were difficult to explore um, and the MDMA allows you to kind of revisit these hotspots in a very invitational friendly kind of way and I could I could talk various different languages about what it does and one of the things that drives the MDMA in that journey or in that process is the pro-social aspect of it people with PTSD are very isolated from the outside world. They feel disconnected from the outside world and they feel disconnected from their selves, from their affect or so that they've alienated themselves from. And what the MDMA does, it is a friendly re-invitation of getting to know your inner self and actually reconnecting with the world. Now that's a romantic or sort of maybe a poetic way of saying, but the drug catalyzes in that way the process of psychotherapy where you have to explore things that happened to you that really affected you in a negative way, that disrupted your life and disrupted the way that you got to know yourself and could lead to a whole set of unfriendly, uncomfortable symptoms of nightmares and irritability and angry outbursts and, uh, and feeling disconnected from the society. So that's a long range of telling that MDMA is a catalyst to the psychotherapeutic process that is a friendly way, an invitational way to explore things that, uh, that got stuck along the way. One of the most challenging parts of integrating MDMA in 
our current models of psychotherapy is, of course, it's a class one drug. And, and you need to have a license or so to do research. So the availability for, um, for care is, is, is difficult. So we have to find ways to make the access to MDMA in certain centers that have a license more uh, available. Um, there needs to be regulations. First, we need to have the evidence that these regulations can come into the place, for sure. Um, then then the, the, the next is the educational material, because you need to have people who are trained um, to deliver the treatment to people who are in need. So first you need to have the, the, um, the, 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 the regulation, and second you need to have the education ready to deliver this on a wider scale. MAPS, the organization that is sponsoring now most of the studies on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, provides training. It provides training for new therapists that want to be trained as an MDMA-assisted psychotherapist. They have an educational package, which is very well thought through. Um, and everybody who wants to do MDMA-assisted psychotherapy has to be in that course. And it's, a, it's an online course, it's a residential course, it's, it's, it's a whole range of activities that you have to do. Um, and um, I think that's, that's a requirement. And on top of that, you need to be eligible to be doing that training. So currently we're like, who is qualified to do that training? Do you need to be a medical doctor? Do you need to be a clinical psychologist? Maybe a master of science, maybe a bachelor of science? What, what degree do you need to have in order to be qualified to provide or to, to receive that training? Yeah, there is a hype on psychedelics in a wider sense, and maybe there is a hype on MDMA. And I, I can tolerate that and I can understand that, that there is a hype because we've been, we've been refrained from um, a compound and a strategy and an innovation in psychotraumatology that is so powerful. And this one is so powerful from the first set of data that we've seen that of course people are very intrigued and of course the media is there and a lot of young therapists are, 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 are really keen on getting to know more about this and maybe also it is because it's iffy it's been scheduled one and there's a history about it so it has a mixture of connotations that contribute partly to why there is so so much of interest now and we have the recreational arm of of the ecstasy uh, quote unquote industry as well the decriminalization or so of some of the psychedelics um, uh, so we have to be sort of in the scientific domain, we have to sort of be careful not to jump too much on the hype, but be, you know, with, a, with an open mind and with a good rigor in science, as we typically need to do that, uh, and conduct a research agenda and a clinical agenda to bring this further. Currently, what MAPS is um, offering is, is their therapy training. And part of the therapy training is have your own MDMA assisted psychotherapy experience. It's not mandatory, it's optional. And typically the question comes up like, do you feel that it's necessary to have your own experience uh, having had an MDMA assisted psychotherapy session? And I would opt for yes, that it is um, necessary but not mandatory. Some people, you can't force somebody to do this and they can still be a therapist, I think and they could probably have another psychedelic experience or maybe another experience that comes close to the psychedelic experience. And some people enjoy holotropic breath work or other ways of getting around, getting closer to the psychedelic experience. But if you're open to it and you allow yourself and you can tolerate that, then I think it is a way to you know, have your own uh, understanding of what it is like that you will give patients or clients later. And um, I think it is a benefit, a big time benefit to do that. As a psychiatrist, we have our own psychotherapeutic training and we sit on the other side. And uh, typically in the Netherlands, we have, have a requirement of 50 hours of psychotherapeutic training and you can decide systems approach or cognitive behavioral approach or psychodynamic approach where you feel what it is like to be a patient and to sort of revisit your own psychodynamic 
sort of evolution or so. We've all been through things. We all grew up as children and became adults. And in a way, this also would qualify as something like that. I would think this is also something that you need to have felt, quote unquote felt, in order to move on, to move further. And it helps you to have the vocabulary. It helps you to, f to, to experience the, the, like say, what Aldous Huxley would say, doors of perception are open. To, to experience what that is, what it resembles and what it is to, um, to feel, well, not everybody needs to have ego dissolution per se as a, as a sensory perception, but to have a sort of language of what can happen in that state is very helpful to guide a patient better. I don't think that this will cloud any objectivity to research. I think it will refine research. I think it'll enhance the quality of the, the, the therapeutic process it allows you to explore the quality of the phenomenology or so that you see in the other person better than before. Um, so, no, clouding would not be a right word that would come in my, my domain. Um, so, no, I think on the contrary, it'll enhance your perceptual ability to fine-tune um, uh, therapy. And from a research arm, the rigor of research is independent of any experience that you then have with any psychedelic compound or so in another setting. The rigor of science is independent and uh, they're objective and we know the rules, we know the objectives and we need to stick to that. It's, it's very interesting to explore and to kind of have a vision towards the, um, the mental health care system. If, if if we can get a grip on implementing um, a psychedelics or MDMA assisted psychotherapy in mainstream healthcare, um, I don't know if mainstream healthcare would be tailored currently to implement something like MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Um, my idea around this is that there could be a need or could be an opportunity for specialized clinics, and you can call them psychedelic clinics or so that have licensing and have qualified therapists to be supportive or to be separate from mainstream healthcare clinics. It could be that that's all reversed and that's going to be different, but from how I, knew, how I look at it now is that there will be satellite clinics that have academic uh, connotations or affiliations or, or not that have licensed therapists that are going to develop independent as ways to deliver this novel type, type, type of healthcare. And they have, of course, they have to have ties with insurance companies and it has to also be organized. But I think that there is, um, and this will take a lot of time, this will not be done, done tomorrow, but uh, with the renaissance that we currently see in, in, in ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, and a lot, a lot of compounds and medical marijuana, it's a point of no return. That there is such a such a hype, demand, and need to integrate these in a novel way of delivering healthcare. So, so my gut feeling now, and my also my when I get my brains around it, is that uh, you'll see it already at several several uh, sites. The U.S. is sort of kind of taking the lead here, and the Europe is lagging a little bit behind, and. Um, Probably what's been going on years ago underground now gets more sophisticated and well, well regulated and well organized and very visible and very open and tangible in a novel way of delivering healthcare. Every time I say we got gold in our hands, if we talk about MDMA, but we have to preserve the gold. We have to kind of give it its purpose and its setting. So that said, makes it very important to um, get qualified uh, therapists to use that gold and not dilute it and give it away to people who think like, oh, let's have MDMA and then the world's going to be a better place. No, it is, uh, it's an ingredient that needs to be embedded in psychotherapy. So we need to have licensed people who are well trained, who are well equipped, that have supervision and intervision. This is not simple. This is not therapy that's like, okay, it's easy or so. I don't, I think, I don't think that therapy is easy. It's a diff difficult process and it's a struggle. But this catalyzes and helps in a big time. The other side effect of medicalization is if it's medical, then 
some people who are not qualified to get it or so are refrained from getting access to that therapy. So we have to find ways to deliver it to the people who are really at need. Another one that I do want to mention, though, is um, maybe it's in the site in, in the same domain as the um, the um, the medicalization is. Um, we need to find ways to ensure the quality of the uh, therapy. And often, what you see with novel therapies is they get diluted after a while. So you need to optimize the training, preserve the same, let's say. Um, the same richness of, of all the ingredients and contribute to the therapeutic effect. And, um, and typically what you see if, 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 you have a, if you have a strategy or so, then let's deconstruct it. Let's deconstruct it, let's leave out. Like for now we have, let's say, 72 hours of therapy in the MDMA psychotherapy. It's like that works. Now let's do less. Let's see if we can do the same in like 16 hours or so. It's like, okay, I wouldn't do that too early because first let's treat the people who are really at need and, um, and give them the best therapy and not, not minimize it to a package that is kind of minimal. The goal, the holy grail, is to prevent PTSD. And the holy grail of preventing PTSD is not exposing people to potentially traumatic events. But the society is not built like that. We are, uh, by default, exposed to potentially traumatic events. Now, if somebody is exposed, can you then prevent a disorder from treating it very early on, before it occurs, which would be then immediately after. That's a, it's, it's very difficult because you don't know who's developing PTSD out of a larger population. So you would need to treat people with, in that domain with MDMA who are not going to get PTSD at all. So you need to have a sort of what we call now an endophenotype of somebody or a vulnerable phenotype of somebody who might develop PTSD and then maybe Maybe we, I mean, there's now research that we can give MD, uh, EMDR to people. We have a cognitive vaccination by, by letting them play Tetris to stimulate working memory, to reduce intrusive memories. Maybe another arm could be, if there would be a sufficient evidence, to give them MDMA before. If that would help to, and that would be my answer, to help the reconsolidation of the traumatic event in a different way so that it doesn't lead to PTSD, then I'm all in favor, whatever they have to take or so. If you want to become an MDMA assisted psychotherapist or so, you have to be interested in human behavior, you have to be interested in people, and you have to be patient. Because MDMA assisted psychotherapy is a process that doesn't go quickly. It's not a quick fix, like in, like in 45 minutes or so, like a therapy session. This is a, a session that lasts for eight hours. And you have to be able to tolerate and to be attentive. And you have to be with the person who is, um, who is opening their, um, their sensory perception in, in a sense that they're very vulnerable for themselves. And you have to be able to tolerate the affect that is, is made available. So there's a couple of psychotherapy qualities of patience and interest. And of course, you need to have some clinical background of what can happen in people who are um, troubled with, uh, with these uh, yeah, uh, major, major events. You have to appreciate yourself as being a therapist, by all means, to uh, guide somebody with uh, struggles in um, who's, who's ill, who has a disorder, or is sick, or has complaints. And you need to be fascinated with um, levels of consciousness that people can experience. And you need to be tolerating, able to tolerate a lot of affect that people can have of anger, or sadness, or grief, or joy, or... Career path-wise, if somebody would be interested in, um, in MDMA psychotherapy, you have to be um, trained, uh, get, get a license or so in either psychology or, or any arm that, that sets you up to be qualified to become a trainer, to see patients or clients, and then get a proper training and, uh, and, and build a team and affiliate yourself with an institution, preferably an academic institution or another institution that has, has a certain a specific rigor that um, wants to conduct and engage in studies. Affiliate with MAPS or other organizations that stimulate 
uh, uh, these types of, uh, of, of research uh, areas. Um, so if and, and, and you know don't give up too quickly. It's not something that um, you feel that you can achieve within a week or in a month. So it's a it's a long breath. It's something you have to invest in. And if somebody has a career path like I want to do this, we'll make make an agenda for for a couple of years, and don't give up too quickly because we're not there yet. It's not mainstream. So so make 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 a plan for like where they want to be in five years or so. That that um, that tolerate that that that's failure and that gradually you'll see that it may happen the beauty now of what we see in mdma is not patented there's nobody who's making a lot of money on mdma and it should never be done or so because this should be available for people who are really in need the therapy around it makes it a little bit more expensive because it's labor it's man labor but um, it's a different compound and um, um, I think, therefore, it has a, has a value in itself that it's not going to be available because of the high cost to only people who can afford these high costs to be made. There are multiple initiatives like the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research and there's other of these national initiatives on the stimulation of psychedelic science and, and clinical care and I really, I really enjoy uh, seeing these developments in Europe and outside and I, I think that it's really important that we uh, support each other in, because we all have our national regulations and we really need to support each other to stimulate each other, to encourage each other and to kind of convince the regulatory agencies that there needs to be a move in favor of something that moves into the psychedelic domain. Because that's a long haul and we need to embrace each other and stimulate each other to do the right thing.